Well, as we went to edit this evening's uh, service, we realized that we had a problem with microphones during the service. Basically, the batteries on the, my lapel mic died, and we didn't realize what the problem was until the service was over. So at this point in the service, the prayer of dedication, uh, there is no sound. And that carries through until uh, just a little bit into the sermon uh, this morning. But I wanted you to get the scripture reading this evening and the portion of the uh, beginning of the sermon that we missed on the audio for you. So I know it's a little bit weird. Here I am with my uh, bedroom curtains behind me. A uh, little different look than the rest of the service does. Uh, but I hope you'll uh, be patient and understand why. Our scripture reading for the sermon this morning comes from the gospel according to Mark, and I would love it if uh, you have a Bible handy, if you could go ahead and pick that up next to you to follow along with our scripture reading. We are working our way through a series in the gospel of Mark, and we're up to uh, chapter 8, so if you've got your Bible with you, open up to Mark chapter 8. I'll be reading verses 27 through 38. That's the end of chapter 8. And I hope you'll follow along with me in your Bible. I'll be reading from the English Standard Version. No substantive difference from the New International Version or whatever you might have there with you. Uh, just a few different ways of phrasing and a couple of words are in a different order than yours might be. Hear the word of the Lord. And Jesus went on with his disciples to the villages of Caesarea Philippi. And on the way, he asked his disciples, who do people say that I am? And they told him, John the Baptist, and others say Elijah, and, and others one of the prophets. And he asked them, But who do you say that I am? Peter answered him, You are the Christ. And he strictly charged them to tell no one about him. And he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed, and after three days rise again. And he said this plainly, and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But turning and seeing his disciples, Jesus rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan, for you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. And he called the crowds to him with his disciples, and he said to them, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels will save it. For what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his soul? For what can a man give in return for his soul? For whoever is ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him will the Son of Man also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father and with the holy angels. The word of the Lord. Well, as I said, we are starting or we are continuing our winter sermon series, a series that we're calling Reset back to the basics of following Jesus. Here we are, it is the first week of February, and I'm willing to bet that at this point in time, if you're the type of person who makes New, Year, New Year's resolutions, we're probably right about the point where you might be wavering in your commitment to those resolutions. Maybe you made it two or three weeks and you've already given up. Maybe you're really struggling to hang on to that commitment, and you're feeling the need to reset your commitment to that resolution. Well, I think something very similar happens to us in our walk with Jesus Christ. We start out when we first become a Christian and we're so passionate and committed to our walk with the Lord. But as the years go by, as time passes, we begin to pick up practices of our faith, even things that we might believe that, well, frankly, they're just not biblical. They're not things that necess they're not necessarily bad, but they just aren't things that Jesus talked about or told us to do or what we ought to believe. Just like with our New Year's resolutions, sometimes we need a reset. We need to get back to the basics of what it means to follow Jesus. And that's what we're doing in this series. We're going back to the Gospel of Mark, and we're looking at the things that Jesus said and did to get a sense of who we are actually supposed to be as Christians and try to reclaim uh, some of that fervor that we first had when we started following him. Last week, we looked at a passage where Jesus talks about the traditions of the church, and we saw that when our traditions point to Jesus, rather than Jesus pointing to our traditions, we are set free to find a faith that leads to life 
and joy. Now I'm going to turn things back over to the service as it was happening and resume the sermon from this point. Thanks again. Now, one of the aspects about being a Christian that I don't think we think about or talk about very often, at least not in an explicit way, is that of being a disciple. Now, we do talk a lot about the disciples, and at least within church leadership, like the session and whatnot, we talk about the need uh, for discipleship and the need to be discipled. But I don't think most of us, when we think about what it means to be a Christian, would put being a disciple at least near the top of the list, if we were to put it on the list at all. We might talk about a Christian as somebody who is a follower of Christ, someone who believes in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. We might even put the relatively bland statement of a Christian as someone who goes to church as an answer, and all of those things are true, but for Jesus and the New Testament authors, being a disciple of Jesus Christ might well have been the only answer that they would give to the question of what is a Christian? In fact, in the Great Commission itself, Jesus himself said that we are to go and make disciples of all nations. I think it's safe to say that we are long overdue for a discipleship reset. And as we look at our passage this morning, we will see that being a follower, a disciple of Jesus Christ means following wherever he leads, even if we don't like it or don't understand it. Would you please take a moment and pray with me? Lord God, Jesus walked the face of this earth, and as he did so, he called people by name to follow him. He extended that invitation to come and follow him, to become his disciple. And that work of Jesus Christ, Lord, has never stopped. For the past 2,000 years, you've been calling men and women throughout the ages to come follow you and be your disciple. But God, I think along the way, we've lost something of what that truly means. And I pray, God, that you would open our eyes, that you would soften our hearts, that you would draw us closer to you, and that you would continue to extend the invitation to us through your Holy Spirit to come follow you and be your disciple. May we gain a deeper understanding of just what that invitation means this morning. In your son's precious and holy name, we pray. Amen. Well, I think it is a reasonably easy argument to make that uh, in many ways, being a Christian, particularly being a conservative evangelical Christian, is suffering something of a public relations problem in our culture today. Pretty safe to say maybe, mostly, I think. We've talked about this a lot recently, and there's certainly plenty being written about it in the news and online. And frankly, I really think that most likely this PR problem is probably going to get worse before it gets better. The problem with this PR problem is that, darn it, so much of it is so justly deserved and warranted. The fact of the matter is, is that there are a lot of people out there who claim to be Christian, but sure don't look or sound like Jesus. When some studies show that the divorce rate inside the conservative Christian church is higher than in the secular culture around us, we have a problem. When people who say that they love Jesus use hate-filled, mocking, and condescending language about those with whom they disagree, we have a problem. When more and more couples who claim to be followers of Jesus Christ choose to cohabitate instead of getting married, we have a problem. When non-Christians look at the lives of people who say that they're Christians and can't see any difference between them at all and how they live, 
we have a problem. When we say that we believe in Jesus Christ, but we don't live like it, let alone even try to live like it, we have a problem. And that problem is that we have forgotten what it means to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. If, as we said at the beginning, that being a disciple should be the primary mark of a Christian, then we are definitely in need of a discipleship reset. And the place to start our discipleship reset is by first asking, well, what is a disciple? In our passage this morning, we read that Jesus went on with his disciples to the villages of Caesarea Philippi. And on the way, he asked his disciples, who do people say that I am? The Greek word that is translated disciple in this passage and throughout the New Testament is methetes. And in somewhat and it's somewhat literally translated as pupil or apprentice. But the word carries a much deeper meaning than either of those words implies. More accurately, a, a disciple is someone who binds himself to someone else in order to acquire his practical and theoretical knowledge. A disciple is someone who commits themselves to following a teacher or a master, learning from them by word and by example, and seeking to emulate them as much as they possibly can. But as with so many things, Jesus takes this idea of being a disciple and he gives the disciple-master relationship his own distinctive coloring. We see this best in Matthew chapter 11, verses 28 through 30. Come to me. Get away with me and you'll recover your life. I'll show you how to take a real rest. Walk with me and work with me. Watch how I do it. Learn the unforced rhythms of grace. I won't lay anything heavy or ill-fitting on you. Keep company with me, and you'll learn to live freely and lightly. That is the picture of how discipleship under Jesus Christ is supposed to look. Coming to Jesus when he calls us. Walking with him. Working with him. Watching how he does it. Learning the unforced rhythms of grace. The response to Jesus' invitation to be a disciple is the beginning of something new. It means losing one's old life and finding new life in the family of God through obeying the will of the Father. Following Jesus as a disciple means the unconditional sacrifice of one's whole life for the whole of your life. I don't know about you, but that sounds just a little tiny bit stronger than just believing in Jesus Christ. Having seen what it means when Jesus says that we are to be his disciples, as we continue our discipleship reset this morning, we now turn our attention to the marks of a disciple. There are three particular marks of a disciple of Jesus Christ that Mark gives us in our passage this morning. A true disciple of Jesus Christ knows who Jesus is, doesn't try to correct Jesus, and follows wherever it is that Jesus leads. The first mark of a disciple is that a disciple knows who Jesus is. Our passage this morning opened with Jesus asking his disciples, who do people say that I am? And they told him, John the Baptist, and others say Elijah, and others one of the prophets. And he asked them, but who do you say that I am? Peter answered him, you are the Christ. And Jesus strictly charged them to tell no one about him. We, uh, we so often and commonly today, 2,000 years later, refer to him as Jesus Christ that we miss how revolutionary Peter's claim really was for his time. In fact, it was so crazy, so outside the box of what anybody could have possibly said that in, Ma in the Gospel of Matthew, Jesus responds by saying, Blessed are you, Simon Bar-Jonah. For flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. Peter couldn't have come up with the answer on his own. It had to be inspired by the Holy Father. 
Have you ever asked or been asked a question and, and almost before you realize it, you know that you know the answer? Although you have no idea how or why, but you know what the right answer is. You don't even realize the full implications of the answer you're about to give. Have you ever had that happen? It's rare. It's like happened like once in my life. Every other time I've been wrong. But that one time was crazy. It's like, where did that come from? What did I just say? That's kind of what happened to Peter right here. Eugene Peterson explains it this way. In Mark's telling of the gospel, he put this question and this answer at the exact center of the story. Literally, it is at the center of Mark's gospel, just as, as it is experientially at the center of our lives. Every line of narrative and every detail of life converge at this point. Random events, unfinished projects, restless meanderings, discouraging failures, disappointing successes, these are all funneled into the narrow way of this question and this answer. God puts the question to each one of us and waits for an answer. He is here to be answered, not questioned. Will you worship the God who made you? He is here to be recognized, not looked for. Will you believe in the God who loves you? He is here to be received, not bargained with. Will you accept the God who saves you. There is no question more important in our life than this one. Who do you say that I am? And if our answer is anything other or less than you are the Christ, we need to go back and revisit our understanding of just who we think Jesus is. To be the Christ means that we believe everything that, that we said about him this morning in the Apostles' Creed that he is our savior, he is our Lord, he is our king. The only savior, the only Lord, the only king of the entire world. The first mark of a disciple of Jesus Christ is knowing who Jesus is. The second mark of a disciple of Jesus Christ is that a disciple doesn't try to correct Jesus. Well, that might seem kind of crazy. Who would try to correct Jesus? But remember, as our story continues on, right after Peter's incredible declaration of Jesus as the Christ, Jesus then begins to explain the implications of what this means to his disciples about his upcoming suffering, his death, and his resurrection. And this was, this was way too much for the disciples to handle. I mean, this is, this is crazy talk. Did somebody check to see if Jesus is feeling okay? Hold on. He can't be serious about this. And so Peter pulls Jesus aside, and he tries to explain this. First off, hang on, Jesus. you got to understand, very little can be accomplished if you die. Because that's kind of final. It's, it's, you can't do a whole lot after that. Second, people just don't rise from the dead. That's not a thing people do. And thirdly, thirdly, let's be honest, Jesus, nobody chooses the way of suffering and death. What are you talking about? That's not the way to go about this. So Peter's trying to correct Jesus because clearly, clearly, Jesus has gotten this part wrong and somebody needs to straighten him out. And Peter does the job. It's pretty easy for us to look at Peter in this moment and recognize just how much he's missed the mark here. But are we really that much better? I mean, surely Jesus didn't mean it when he said that when we call someone a fool, we might as well have just murdered them. Or, or that to look lustfully at a woman is just as bad as actually committing adultery with them. I mean, there's no way that Jesus was serious when he said, if you want to follow me, sell everything that you have and give it to the poor and then come follow me. And that's just, that's just crazy talk, right? I mean, there's no way that Jesus was serious when he said, you know, you're, you're supposed to love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. I mean, that, you don't do that. He couldn't have meant that, could he? There's so many other teachings of Jesus that, frankly, 
we really don't like or we really struggle with them and we really kind of write them off and go, you know what, that, he, he, couldn't, he couldn't have meant that at all. But when we do that, we're doing the very same thing that Peter does here in this passage. And Jesus responds to us the same way. Get behind me, Satan. For you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. Brothers and sisters, if we say that we are disciples of Jesus Christ, if we say that, we, that he is our Lord, then the one thing that we cannot say to him is no. Nor can we tell him that he is wrong. Peter rebuked Jesus. We might say, well, I mean, that was, that was 2,000 years ago. It was a different world back then. If Jesus knew what it was like in 2021... He surely wouldn't have said, there's no way he would have said that, right? Guys, if Jesus is our Lord, then the one thing that we cannot ever say is no, Lord. It's an impossible sentence. If Jesus says go, our answer is how far? Jesus says, do this, we start to do it. That's what it means for him to be the master, for him to be our Lord. We do what he says. And can we be honest with ourselves? Jesus is exactly right in this passage. The only time that we think he's wrong is when our minds are on the things of man rather than the things of God. It's when I start thinking about myself and my family and my stuff that I like. That I start having a really hard time with some of the teachings of Jesus. But when my mind is set on him and on the kingdom of God, all the rest of it starts to make a whole lot more sense. The first mark of a disciple of Jesus Christ is knowing who Jesus is. And the second mark is that a disciple doesn't try to correct Jesus. And that leads us to the third mark of a disciple of Jesus Christ. A disciple follows where Jesus leads. When Jesus called the disciples to follow him, he meant it fairly literally. They left their way of life and living, and they followed Jesus wherever he went, all over Israel, all over the Mediterranean region. Where he went, they followed. And here we are 2,000 years later, and the invitation from Jesus Christ to us is exactly the same. To follow Jesus wherever he leads. And I got to be honest, it is just as hard to follow him now as it was back then. Now there are three particular steps Jesus invites us to take when we set out to follow him. Jesus said, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. The first step, Jesus says, is to deny yourself. That's what Jesus meant when he told Peter that he wasn't setting his mind on the things of God, but rather was setting his mind on the things of man. To deny yourself doesn't mean that your wants and desires don't matter. They do. It just means that we put God's priorities ahead of our own. Paul explains it best in Philippians 2. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility consider others better than yourselves. Each of you should look not only to your own interests, we do still look to our own interests, but also to the interests of others. Your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus. And Paul goes on into that beautiful hymn describing how Jesus gave up all of the glory, the wonder, the power of heaven in order to become a slave on earth. Eventually going so far as to die on the cross for our sakes. That is our model. When we think about denying ourselves, we just do what Jesus himself did. When we follow Jesus, we set aside our desires and wants for the sake 
of the desires and wants of the kingdom of God. The second step, Jesus says, is to take up your cross. Jesus continues, For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake in the Gospels will save it. As if everything about being a disciple so far has been easy, right? As we've been going through this and talking, we're like, oh yeah, that's cake. I got that part. That's no problem, right? And now he says, now you got to take up your cross because it wasn't hard enough already. Yeah, let's be honest. We don't like the idea of taking up our cross in order to follow Jesus. We don't like the idea of suffering, no matter what it's for, even if it's for Jesus' sake. But this, brothers and sisters, is a central part of being a disciple. To be a disciple is to know the master and follow in his steps as closely as possible. And his steps went directly to the cross. And we cannot know Jesus if we do not follow him to the cross. Once again, the words of St. Paul, I want to know Christ. Yes, to know the power of his resurrection and participation in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, and so somehow attaining to the resurrection from the dead. There was nothing else that Paul wanted than to know Jesus as intimately as possible. And the only way to know Jesus intimately was to pick up his cross and follow Christ, just as Jesus did. And the same is still true for us. We follow Jesus when we deny ourselves and when we take up our cross. And the third step, the one we've been leading to all this time and even said several times, is to do that very thing, to actually follow him wherever he leads. We step in his footsteps. We say what Jesus said. We love as Jesus loved. We go where Jesus went into our communities, carrying the message of hope, life, love, and grace that can only be found through Jesus Christ. As we follow Jesus ourselves, we go inviting others to join us in that journey. Brothers and sisters, Jesus didn't die on the cross just to forgive you of your sins. He died on the cross to forgive you of your sins, but not just to forgive you of your sins. He died on the cross to remake you and me and all of us from the inside out to become a disciple of his. May God bless you as you learn to live freely and lightly by following the unforced rhythms of God's grace as a disciple of Jesus Christ, a disciple who knows who he is, doesn't try to correct Jesus, and follows where he leads by denying ourselves, taking up our crosses, and following him. Amen.